Hello, Cardinal. In our last reading, we learned about Daedalus and Icarus and how Daedalus helped Queen Pasiphae to create the Minotaur. Uh, today, we are going to be reading the story of Theseus. I highly recommend that you highlight along with me as this tale is much longer than ones we have read previously. Um, and I fear that you will forget a lot of it. So it's really in your best interest to highlight what I highlight. This is the story of Theseus. There was once a king of Athens whose name was Aegeus. He had no son, but he had 50 nephews, and they were waiting for him to die so that one of them could take his place. They were wild, worthless fellows, and the people of Athens looked forward with dread to the day when the city would be in their power. Yet, so long as Aegeus lived, the rowdy nephews could not do much harm. They were generally content to spend their time feasting and drinking at the king's table and quarreling among themselves. It so happened one summer that Aegeus left his kingdom in the care of the elders of the city and went on a voyage across the sea to the old and famous city of Trozen, which lay nestled at the foot of the mountains on the opposite shore. Trozen was not 50 miles by water from Athens, and the purple peaked island of uh, Aegina lay between them. But to the people of that early time, the distance seemed very great. It was not often that ships passed from one place to another, and as for going by land round the great bend of the sea, that was a thing so fraught with danger that no sane man had ever dared try it. King Piteus of Trozen was right glad to see Aegeus, for they had been boys together. And he welcomed him to the city and did all that he could to make his visit a pleasant one. Day after day, there was feasting and merriment and music in the marble halls of old Trozen. And the two kings spent many happy hours talking about the deeds of their youth and of the mighty heroes whom they had both known. And when the time came for the ship to sail back to Athens, Aegeus was not ready to go. He said he would stay yet a little while longer in Trozen and that the elders of the city could manage things well at home. The ship returned without him. But Aegeus stayed, not so much for the rest and enjoyment which he was having in his, the home of his old friend, as for the sake of Aethra, the, his old friend's daughter. For Aethra as, as, was as fair as a summer morning, and she was the joy and pride of Trozen. Aegeus was never so happy as he, when he was in her presence. So it happened that sometime after the ship had sailed, there was a wedding in the calls of King Piteus. But it was kept secret, for Aegeus feared that his nephews, if they heard of it, would be very angry and would send men to Trozen to harm him and his new bride. Month after month passed, and still Aegeus lingered with his bride, trusting his elders to see to the affair of Athens. Then one morning, when the gardens of Trozen were full of roses and the heather was green on the hills, a baby was born to Aethra, a boy with a fair face and strong arm and, and eyes as sharp and as bright as a mountain eagle. And now Aegeus was even more reluctant to return home than he'd ever been before. And he went up to the mountains which overlooked Trozen, and he prayed to Athena, the queen of war and wisdom, to give him insight and show him what to do. Even while he prayed, there came a ship into the harbor, bringing a letter to Aegeus and alarming news um, from Athens. So he found his happiness, he found his peace with this woman, um, but he has been neglecting his kingdom. Come home without delay, these were, were words of the letter which the elders had sent. Come here quickly or Athens will be lost. A great king from beyond the sea, Minos of Crete, is on his way with ships and a host of fighting men. He declares that he will carry sword and fire within our walls and will slay our young men and make our children his slaves come and save us. It is the call of duty, said Aegeus, and with a heavy heart he made ready to go at once across the land or the sea to lead his people. But he could not take Aethra and their child for fear of his lawless nephews, who would have slain them both. Best of wives, he said, when the hour for parting had come, listen to me, for I shall never see your father's halls nor our dear old Trozen nor perhaps your own fair face again. Do you remember the old tree which stands on the mountainside and the great flat stone which lies a little beyond it, the one that no man but myself has ever been able to lift? Under that stone I have hidden my sword and the sandals which I brought from Athens. There they shall lie until our child is strong enough to lift the stone and take them for his own. 
care for him, Aethra, until that time, and then, and not till then, you may tell him of his father and bid him to seek me in Athens. So part of this is a test that he's setting up for his son. He has to be strong enough to lift the stone. Part of it also is to make him wait until he is of age, because we can't have, you know, a seven-year-old kid going out and taking up his dad's sword. You'll see this a lot in mythology, though, somebody setting up a test that you have to pass. In part of the hero's journey, passing this test is part of entering that realm of heroes. Then Aegeus kissed his wife and child and went on board the ship. The sailors shouted, the oars were dipped into the waves, and the white sail spread, was spread to the breeze, and Aethra, from her palace window, saw the vessel speed away over the blue waters toward Aegina and the distant shore. So now we have a subheading, sword and sandals. You might want to divide your notes like this to help you remember parts. Year after year went by, and yet no word reached Aethra from her husband on the other side of the sea. Often she climbed the mountain above Trozen and would sit there all day looking out of the blue waters and the purple hills of Aegina to the dim, distant shore beyond. Now and then she could see a white-winged ship sailing in the offing, but men said that it was a Cretan vessel and very likely was filled with fierce Cretan warriors bound upon some, some cruel errand of war. Then it was rumored that King Minos had seized upon all the ships of Athens and had burned a part of the city and had forced the people to pay him a most grievous tribute. Other than this, there was no news. In the meanwhile, Aethra's son had grown to be a tall, ruddy-cheeked lad, strong as a mountain lion, and she had named him Theseus. On the day that he was 15 years old, he went up with her to the top of the mountain, and he looked out over the sea. Ah, if only your father would come, she sighed. My father, said Theseus, who is my father? And why are you always watching and waiting and wishing he would come? Tell me about him. And she answered, my child, do you see the great flat stone which lies there half buried in the ground and covered with moss and trailing ivy? Do you think you could lift it? I will try, mother, said Theseus. And he dug his fingers into the ground beside it and grasped its uneven edges and tugged and lifted and strained until his breath came hard and his arms ached and his body was covered with sweat, but the stone moved not at all. At last, he said, the task is too hard for me until I have grown stronger, but why do you wish me to lift it? When you are strong enough to lift it, Aethra said, I will tell you about your father. After the, that, the boy went out every day and practiced running and leaping and throwing and lifting. Every day, he rolled smaller stones out of their place. At first, he could move only a little weight, and those who saw him laughed as he pulled and puffed and grew red in the face. But he never gave up until he had lifted his target, and little by little he grew stronger, and his muscles became more like iron bands, and his limbs were like mighty levers for strength. Then on his next birthday, he went up to the mountain with his mother and tried again to lift the great stone, but it remained fast in its place and was not moved. I'm not yet strong enough, mother, he complained. Have patience, my son, said Aethra. So he went on again with his running and his leaping and his throwing and his lifting. He practiced wrestling also and tamed the wild horses of the plain and hunted the lions among the mountains. His strength and swiftness and skill were the wonder of all men, and Trozen was filled with tales of the deeds of the young Theseus. Yet when he tried again on his 17th birthday, he could not move the great flat stone that lay near the tree on the mountainside. Have patience, my son, again, said Aethra. But this time, tears crept into her eyes. So he's been uh, strength training for two years, basically, and he still can't lift the stone. However, he's only 17. So what do you think the myth is trying to do, right? So when you're talking about the hero's journey, we're talking about his unusual upbringing, his unusual childhood. This plays a big part in it. So he went back again to exercising. He learned to wield the sword and the battle axe and to throw tremendous weights and to carry tremendous burdens. And the men said that since the days of Hercules, there was never so great strength in one body. And then when he was a year older, so he's officially 18 now, officially an adult, he climbed the mountain yet again with his mother and he stooped and he took hold of the stone and it yielded to his, yielded to his touch. When he had lifted it quite out of the ground, he found underneath it a sword of bronze and sandals of gold, and these he gave to his mother. Tell me now about my father, he said. 
Aethra rejoiced that this time had that the time had come for which she had waited for so long, and she buckled the sword to his, his belt and fastened the sandals upon his feet, and then she told him who his father was and why he had left him in Trozen, and how he had said that when the lad was strong enough to lift the great stone, he must take the sword and sandals and go and seek him in Athens which coincidentally just happens to be when he turns 18, right? Theseus was glad when he heard this, and his proud eyes flashed with eagerness as he said, I'm ready, mother. I'll set out for Athens this very day. So when we're talking about the hero's journey, this is his call to adventure. When his mother notifies him of his father's words, and he says, I will set out for Athens. It is his call to become a hero. They walked down the mountain together and told King Pityus what had happened and showed him the sword and the sandals. But the old man shook his head sadly and tried to dissuade Theseus from going. How can you go to Athens in these lawless times, he said. The sea is full of pirates. In fact, no ship from Trozen has sailed across the sea since your kingly father went home to help his people 18 years ago. Then finding that this only made Theseus the more determined, he said, but if you must go, I will have a new ship built for you, staunch and stout and fast sailing. Fifty of the bravest young men in Trozen shall go with you, and I, I hope uh, with fair winds and a fearless heart, you will escape the pirates and reach Athens in safety. And then Theseus asks a strange question. Which is the most perilous way to go by ship or to make the journey on foot round the great bend of the land? The seaway is full of perils, says his grandfather, but the landway is beset with dangers tenfold greater. Even if there were good roads and no hindrances, the journey round the shore is a long one and require many days. But there are rugged mountains to climb and the wide marshes to cross and dark forests to go through. There's hardly a footpath in all the wild region, nor any place to rest or shelter, and the woods are full of wild beasts. Dreadful dragons lurk in the marshes, and many cruel robber giants dwell in the mountains. Well, said Theseus, if there are more perils by land than by sea, then I shall go by land and go at once. But it will, will you at least take fifty young men, your companions, to go with you, King Pityus asked. No one shall go with me, said Theseus. And he stood up and played with his sword hilt, laughing at the thought of fear. When there was nothing more to say, he kissed his mother and bade his grandfather goodbye and went out of Trozen towards the trackless coastland, which lay to the west and north. With blessings and tears, the king and Aethra followed him to the city gate and watched him until his tall form was lost to sight among the trees which bordered the shore of the sea. Rough Roads and Robbers With a brave heart, Theseus walked on, keeping the sea always upon his right. Soon the old city of Trozen was left far behind, and he came to the great marshes where the ground sank under him at every step, and green pools of stagnant water lay on both sides of the narrow pathway. But no fiery dragon came out of the reeds to meet him, so he walked on and on until he came to the rugged mountain land which bordered the western shore of the sea. Then he climbed one slope after another until at last he stood on the summit of a great peak from which he could see the whole country spread out around him. The downward and then downward and onward he went again, but his way led him through dark mountain glens and along the edges of mighty precipices and underneath many a frowning cliff until he came to a dreary wood where the trees grew tall and close together and the light of the sun was seldom seen. In that forest there dwelt a robber giant called Corinides, the cudgeler. So I googled a picture of a cudgel for you. This is most likely what you're thinking for. It's basically just, just a giant club. <clears throat> he was the terror of travelers. For oftentimes, Corinides would go down into the valleys where the shepherds fed their flocks and would carry off not only sheep and lambs, but sometimes children and men themselves. It was his custom to hide in the thickets of underbrush close to a pathway and when a traveler passed it that way, leap out upon him and beat him to death with the club. When he saw Theseus coming through the woods, he thought that he would have a rich prize, for he uh, knew from the youth's clothing and manner that he must be a prince. He lay on the ground where, the leaves, where, where leaves of ivy and tall grass screened him from view, and he held his great iron club ready to strike. But Theseus had sharp eyes and quick ears, and neither beast nor giant could have taken him by surprise. 
When Corey Needy slipped out of the building, uh, his hiding place to strike him down, the young man dodged aside so quickly that the heavy club struck the ground behind him. Then, before the robber giant could raise it for a second stroke, Theseus seized the fellow's legs and tripped him. Corey Needy's roared loudly and tried to strike again, but Theseus wrenched the club out of his hands and then dealt him such a blow on the head that he never again harmed travelers passing through the forest. Then the youth went on his way, carrying the huge club on his shoulder, singing a song of victory and looking sharply around him for any other foes that might be lurking among the trees. Just over the ridge of the next mountain, he met an old man who warned him not to go any further. He said that close by a grove of pine trees, which he would soon pass on his way down the slope, there dwelt a robber who was very cruel to strangers. He is called Pitiocampes, the pine bender. So we have our second robber. For when he has caught a traveler, this guy's kind of messed up, okay, just, just to let you know. He bends two tall pine, light pine trees to the ground and binds his captain to them, a hand and a foot on the top of one and a hand and a foot on the top of the other. And then he lets the trees fly up and he roars with laughter when he sees the traveler's body torn in thunder. It seems to me, says Theseus, that it is full time to rid the world of such a monster. And he thanked the kind man who had warned him. He hastened onward, whistling merrily as he went down towards the grove of pines, and soon he came inside of a robber's house, built near the foot of a jutting cliff. Behind it was a rocky gorge and a roaring mountain stream, and in front of it was a garden wherein grew all kinds of rare plants and beautiful flowers. But the tops of the pine trees were laden with bones of unlucky travelers, which hung bleaching white in the sun and wind. On a stone by the roadside sat Pitiocampes himself, when he saw Theseus coming, he approached the prince, twirling a long rope in his hands and crying out, Welcome! Welcome, stranger. Welcome to my inn, the traveler's rest. What kind of entertainment have you, said Theseus? Have you a pine tree bent down to the ground and ready for me? I, two of them, said the robber. I knew that you were coming, and I bent two of them just for you. As he spoke, Pitiocampes threw his rope towards Theseus and tried to entangle him in its coils. But the young man leaped aside, and when the robber rushed upon him, he dodged beneath his hands and seized his legs, as he had seized Coriolanides, and threw him heavily to the ground. Then the two wrestled together among the trees, and but not long, for Pitiocampes was no match for the lithe young foe. Theseus knelt upon the robber's back as he lay prone among the leaves and tied him with his own cord to the two pine trees which were already bent down, as you would have done unto me. So I will do unto you, Theseus said. Then Pitiocampes wept and prayed and made a fair promise, but Theseus would not hear him. He turned away and the tree sprang up and the robber's body was left dangling from those branches. The road which Theseus followed now led him closer to the shore. By and by he came to a place where the mountains seemed to rise sheer out of the sea and there was only a narrow path high up along the side of the cliff. Far, bound, uh, far down beneath his feet, he could hear waves dashing against a rock, um, while above him a mountain eagle circled and screamed, and great crags and barren peaks glistened in the sunlight. But Theseus went on fearlessly and came at last to a place where a spring of clear water bubbled out from a cleft in the rock. There, the path was narrowish, narrower still, and the low doorway of a cavern opened up upon it. Close by the spring sat a red-faced giant with a huge club across his knees, guarding the road so that no one could pass. In the sea at the foot of the cliff basked a huge turtle, its leaden eyes looking always upward for food. Theseus realized that this must be the domain of uh, Siron, a brother of Pitiocampes, who was the terror of all the coast and liked to make strangers wash his feet so that while they were doing so, he might kick them over a cliff and be eaten by his vicious pet turtle. Of the three ways to go so far, beaten with a club, torn apart by trees, or eaten by a turtle, I'm going with eaten by the turtles, the worst. <sighs> when Theseus approached, the robber raised his club and said fiercely, no man can pass here until he has washed my feet. Come, set to work. And then Theseus smiled and said, is your turtle hungry today? And do you want me to feed him? Siron's eyes flashed fire and he said, you shall feed him, but you shall wash my feet first. And with that, he brandished his club in the air and rushed forward to strike. 
But Theseus was ready. With the iron club which he had taken from Corinides, he met the blow midway, and the robber's weapon was knocked out of his hands and sent spinning over the edge of the cliff. And then Siron, black with rage, tried to grapple with him, but Theseus was too quick for that. He dropped his club and seized Siron by the throat, and he pushed him back against the ledge on which he had been sitting, and he threw him sprawling upon the sharp rocks, holding him there, hanging halfway over the cliff. Enough, enough, Siron cried, let me up and you may pass on your way. It's not enough, said Theseus. And he drew his sword and sat down by the side of um, the spring. You must wash my feet now. Come, set to work. And then Siron, white with fear, washed his feet. And now, said Theseus, when the task was ended, as you have done unto others, so I will do unto you. There was a scream in midair, which the mountain eagles answered from above, and then there was a great splashing in the water below as the turtle consumed its meal. Athens was now less than 20 miles away, so he strode bravely onward, happy in the thought that he was so near the end of his long journey. But it was very slow traveling up uh, among the mountains, and he was not always sure that he was following the right path. The sun was almost down when he came to a broad green valley where the trees had been cleared away. A little river flowed through the middle of this valley, and on either side were grassy meadows where cattle were grazing, and on a hillside close by, half hidden among the trees, there was a great stone house with vines all over its walls and roof. While Theseus was wondering who it could be that lived in this pretty but lonely place, a man came out of the house and hurried down the road to meet him. He was a well-dressed man, and his face was wreathed with smiles. He bowed low to Theseus and invited him kindly to come up to the house and be his guest that night. This is a lonely place, he said, and it's not often that travelers pass this way, but there's nothing that gives me so much joy as to find strangers and feast them at my table and hear them tell the tales that they have uh, seen and heard. Come up and sup with me and lodge under my roof. You shall sleep on a wonderful bed which I have, a bed which fits every guest and cures him of every ill. Um, we'll talk about this in a second. Theseus was pleased with the man's ways, and as he was both hungry and tired, he went up with him and sat down under the vines by the door. The man said, now I will go in and make the bed ready for you, and you can lie down upon it and rest. Later, when you feel refreshed, you shall sit at my table and sup with me, and I'll listen to the pleasant tales which I know you will tell. When he had gone into the house, Theseus looked around and would see what sort of place it was. He was filled with surprise at the riches of it, of it, at the gold and silver and beautiful things with which every room seemed to be adorned, for it was indeed a place fit for a prince. While he was looking and wondering, the vines before him were parted, and the fair face of a young girl peeped out. Noble stranger, she whispered, do not lie down on my master's bed, for those who do so never rise again. Fly down the glen and hide yourself deep in the woods ere he returns, or else there will be no escape for you. Who is your master, fair maiden, that I should be afraid of him, said Theseus. Men call him Procrustus, or the Stretcher, said the girl. And she talked low and fast. He's a robber. He brings hither all the strangers that he finds traveling through the mountains, and he puts them on his iron bed. He robs them of all they have. No one who ever comes into the house goes out again. Why do they call him the Stretcher? And what is this iron bed of his, said Theseus. Um, in no way alarmed. Did he tell you that it fits all guests, said the girl? It most truly does fit them, for if the traveler is too long, Procrustus hews off his legs until he is of the right length. But if he is too short, as is the case with most guests, then he stretches the man's limbs and bodies with the rope until he is long enough. It is for this reason that men call him the stretcher. Hark, hark, I hear him coming, and the vine leaves, leaves closed over her hiding place. We get a lot of American or English sayings from Greek um, myths, and one saying you guys have heard me talk about Pyrrhic victory before, things like that. But one is the Procrustean bed, and it's when you talk about something that's supposed to be one size fits all. Um, not talking about clothes, but more like policies, uh, governments, things like that. When all they really do is force everyone to fit this very narrow definition, right? Um, so that's where this comes from, this robber Procrustus. So I found some internet examples. They're slightly dorky, but you guys will live, right? So some examples for a Procrustean bed. 
The Procrustean bed that she felt she was forced to define her life ultimately led to her decision to commit suicide at the tender age of 22. This idea that she had to fit so hard into this rigid mold that she just didn't fit at all. Or the ideas that society has adopted regarding how all women should look to be attractive often becomes a Procrustean bed for teenage females. Right, so this idea that the media tells us we need to look a certain way, but for all, some of us, that's not possible. I'm never going to be 5'9", never. I'm also never gonna be 120 pounds. And yet people think that that's the ideal. If I tried to find a way to reach that ideal, it would not be good. Some examples here, I finally know what to compare life to, and what would that be? The story we read today about a Greek mythological thief, Procrustes, Oh, I know that story. It's the guy that puts people on the bed. I fail to see how that describes your life, son, dramatically, because I'm forced to conform to the rules at school and the rules you and mom have in this house, even when I don't want to. You get the idea, even though that one is quite a bit dramatic, right? The very next moment, Procrustes stood in the door, bowing and smiling as though he had never done any harm to his fellow man. My dear young friend, he said, the bed is ready and I will show you the way. After you've taken a pleasant little nap, we'll sit down at table and enjoy a meal together. Theseus arose and followed his host. Um, when they had come into an inner chamber, there surely enough was the bedstead of iron, very curiously wrought and upon it a soft couch, which seemed to invite him to lay down and rest. But Theseus, peering about, saw the axe and the ropes with cunning pulleys lying hidden behind the curtain. He saw, too, that the floor was covered with stains of blood. Now, my dear young friend, said Procrustes, I pay you, pray you lie down and take your ease, for I know that you've traveled far and are faint from want of rest and sleep. Lie down, and while sweet slumber overtakes you, I'll have a care that no unseemly noise nor buzzing fly, nor vexing gnats disturb your dreams. Is this your wonderful bed, asked Theseus? It is, said Procrustes, and you need but to lie down upon it, and it will fit you perfectly. But you must lie upon it first, said Theseus, and let me see how well it is fitted to itself to your stature. Oh, no, said Procrustes, for the spell would be broken. And as he spoke, his cheeks grew ashy pale. But I tell you, you must lie upon it, said Theseus, and he seized the trembling man around the waist and threw him by force upon the bed. And no sooner was he prone upon the couch than curious iron arms reached out and clasped his body in their embrace and held him down so that he could not move hand or foot. The wretched man shrieked and cried for mercy, but Theseus stood over him and looked him straight in the eye. Is this the kind of bed on which you have your guests lie down, he asked. But Procrustes asked, answered not a word. And then Theseus brought out the axe and the ropes and the pulleys and asked him what they were for and why they were hidden in the chamber. He was still silent and could do nothing now but tremble and weep. It is true, said Theseus, that you have lured hundreds of travelers into your den only to rob them. Is it true um, that you, you're moved to fasten them to this bed and then chop off their legs or stretch them out until they fit the iron frame? Tell me, is it true? It's true, it's true, sobbed Procrustes. And now, kindly touching the spring above my head and let me go and you shall have everything that I possess. But Theseus turned away. You're caught, he said, in the trap which you set for others and for me. There is no mercy for the man who shows no mercy. And he went out of the room, leaving the wretch to perish by his own cruel device. Theseus looked through the house and found there was great wealth of gold and silver and costly things which Procrustes had taken from strangers who had fallen into his hands. He went into the dining hall, and there indeed was a table spread with a rich feast of meats and drinks and delicacies such as no king would scorn. But there was a seat and a place for only the host, and none at all for guests. And then the girl whose fair face Theseus had, had seen among the vines came running into the house and seized the young hero's hands and blessed and thanked him because he had rid the world of the cruel Procrustes. Only a month ago, she said, my father, a rich merchant of Athens, was traveling toward Elis uh, Eleusis, and I was with him, happy and carefree as any bird in the green woods. This robber lured us into his den, for we had much gold with us. My father he stretched upon the iron bed, but me he made his slave. Then Theseus called together all the inmates of the house, poor wretches whom Procrustes had forced to serve him, to serve him, and he parted the robber's spoils among them and told them that they were free to go wheresoever they wished. 
The next day he went on through the narrow crooked ways among the mountains and hills and came at last to the plain of Athens, where he saw the noble city and in its midst the rocky heights where the temple of Athena stood. A little way from the temple, he saw the white walls of the palace of the king. Back in Athens. In the years of Theseus's infancy, Minos, king of Crete, had made war upon Athens. He had come with a great fleet of ships and an army and had burned the merchant vessels in the harbor and had overrun the country and the coast. He had laid waste the fields and gardens round about Athens. He had pitched his camp close to the walls and had sent word to the Athenian rulers that he would march into their city with fire and sword and would slay all their young men and would pull down all their houses, even to the temple of Athena, which stood on the great hill above the town. And then Aegeus, the king of Athens, who had arrived just in time to witness the attack with 12 elders who were his helpers, went out to see King Minos to discuss treaty with him. O oh, mighty king, the elder said to Minos, what have we done that you should wish thus to destroy us from the earth? O oh, cowardly and shameless men, answered Minos, why do you ask this foolish question, since you can but know the cause of my wrath? I had an only son, Androgios by name, and he was dearer to me than a hundred cities of Crete and the thousand islands of the sea over which I rule. Three years ago, he came hither to take part in the games uh, which you held in honor of Athena, whose temple you have built on yonder hilltop. You know how he overcame all the other young men in the sports and how your people honored him with song and dance and laurel crown. But when your king, this same Aegeus who stands before me now, saw how everybody ran after him and praised his valor, he was filled with envy and laid plans to kill him. Whether he caused armed men to waylay him on the road to Thebes or whether, as some say, he sent him against a certain wild bull of your country, to be slain by that beast, I know not, but you cannot deny that the young man's life was taken from him through the plotting of your own Aegeus. So King Minos is pissed at Athens because he thinks that the king of Athens killed his kid. But we deny it, we deny this, cried the elders, for at that very time, our king was sojourning at Trozen on the other side of the sea, and he knew nothing of your young prince's death. We ourselves managed the city's affairs while he was abroad, and we know whereof we speak. Androgeos was slain, not through the king's orders, but by the king's nephews. Oh, remember those 50 guys that are just waiting for the king to die so they can take his throne? Now they're killing people. Well, they hoped to rouse your anger against Aegeus so that you would drive him from Athens and leave the kingdom to one of them. Will you swear that what you tell me is true, said Minos? We will swear it, they said. Now then, said Minos, you shall hear my decree. Athens has robbed me of my dearest treasure, a treasure that can never be restored to me. So in return, I require from Athens as tribute that possession which is dearest and most precious to her. Um, and it shall be destroyed cruelly as my son was destroyed. That condition is hard, said the elders, but it is just. What is the tribute re you require? Has the king a son, said Minos. He hasn't gotten there yet, so no. <laughs> the face of King Aegeus lost all his color, and he trembled at the thought of his little child, then left with its mother at faraway Trozen. But the elders knew nothing about that child, and they answered, alas, no, he has no son, but he has 50 nephews who are eating up his substance and longing for the time to come when one of them shall be king. And as we have said, it was them who slew young Prince um, and Androgios, I have not to do with these fellows, said Minos. You may deal with them as you like, but you ask what is the tribute that I require, and I will tell you. Every year when the springtime comes and the roses begin to bloom, you shall choose seven of your noblest youths and seven of your fairest maidens, and you shall send them to me on a ship which your king shall provide. So this is very Hunger Games-esque. Every single year they have to select um, young men and women to basically sacrifice. This is the tribute which you shall pay to me, and if you fail for a single time or delay even a day, my soldiers shall tear down your walls and burn your city and put your men to the sword and sell your wives and children as slaves. We agree to this, O fearsome Minos, said the elders, for it is at least two of the evils, but tell us what shall be the fate of the seven youths and the seven maidens. In Crete, answered Minos, there is a house called the Labyrinth. Uh, so the maze where he put his uh, stepson. 
the like of which you have never seen, and in it there are a thousand chambers and winding ways, and whosoever goes even a little way into them can never find his way out again. Into this house the seven youths and seven maidens shall be thrust, and they shall be left there. To perish with hunger, cried the elders. To be devoured by a monster whom the men call Minotaur, said Mino. Well, I mean, at least they're not starving to death, right? And then King Aegeus and the elders covered their faces and wept and went slowly back into the city to tell the people of their sad and terrible conditions upon which Athens alone could be saved. It's better that a few should perish than that the whole city should be destroyed, they said. Um, this is a good kind of place to think about connection to modern world. Are there things that we do in society that uh, cause a few to suffer, but it's for the good of all? Interesting idea. Years passed, and every spring when the roses began to bloom, seven youths and seven maidens were put on board of a black-sailed ship um, and sent to Crete to pay tribute to, the wa uh, to which King Minos required. In every house in Athens there was sorrow and dread, and the people lifted up their hands to Athena on the hilltop and cried out, How long, O queen of the air, how long shall this continue? Meanwhile, the little child at Trozen had grown to be a man, and he was standing now at the gates of the city. When King Aegeus was told he had a visitor, he gladly met the strong young man, whom it was said by many had cleared the road to Athens. Once glancing at Theseus' shining face, royal sword, and golden sandals, and Aegeus' heart swelled with pride, his son had made his way home. At the same time, the annual black-sailed ship was being rigged for another voyage of sacrifice to Crete. The rude Cretan soldiers paraded the streets, and the herald of the king, Minos, stood at the gates and shouted, Three days, O Athenians, and your tribute um, will be due and must be paid. Then in every street the doors of the houses were shut, and no man went in or out, but everyone sat silent with pale cheeks and wonders who wondered whose lot it would be to be chosen this year. But the prince um, Theseus did not understand, for he had uh, not been told about the tribute. What is the meaning of all this, he cried. What right has a Cretan to demand tribute in Athens, and what is this tribute of which he speaks? And then Aegeus led him aside and with tears told him of the sad war with King Minos and of the dreadful terms of peace. Now say no more, sobbed Aegeus, it's better that a few should die than it all should be destroyed. But I will say more, cried Theseus, Athens shall not pay tribute to Crete. I, must, I myself will go with these youths and maidens, and I will slay the monster Minotaur and defy King Minos himself upon his throne. Oh, don't be so rash, said the king, for no one who is thrust into the den of the Minotaur ever comes out. Remember that you are the hope of Athens, and do not take this great risk upon yourself. Say you that I am the hope of Athens, said Theseus, then how can I do otherwise than go? And he began at once to make himself ready. On the third day, all the youths and maidens of the city were brought together in the marketplace so that lots might be cast for those who were to be taken. And then two vessels of brass were brought out and set before King Aegeus and the herald who had come from Crete. Into one vessel they placed as many balls as there were noble youths in the city and into the other as many as there were maidens. All the balls were white, save only seven in each vessel, and those were black as ebony. And then every maiden, without looking, reached her hand into the vessel and um, drew forth a ball, and those who took the black ones were borne away to the black ship, which lay in waiting by the shore. The young men also drew lots in this manner, but when six black balls had been drawn, Theseus came forward and said, Hold, let no more lots be drawn. I'll be the seventh youth to pay this tribute. So he basically was like, I volunteer myself as tribute. Now let's go aboard the black ship and be off. And then the people and King Aegeus himself went down to the shore to take leave of these young men and maidens whom they had no hope of seeing again. And all but Theseus wept and were broken hearted. I'll come again, father, he said. I will hope that you may, said the king. If when this ship returns, I see a white sail spread on the black one, then I shall know that you are alive and well. But if I see only the same black sail, it will tell me that you have perished. And now the vessel was loosed from its mooring, and the north wind filled the sail, and the seven youths and the seven maidens were borne away over the sea towards the dreadful death which awaited them in far distant Crete. The Princess At last the black ship reached the end of its voyage, and the young people were set ashore, and the party of soldiers led them through the streets towards the prison where they all had to stay until called. 
They did not weep nor cry out, for they had outgrown their fears, but with paler faces and firm-set lips, they walked between the rows of Cretan houses um, and looked neither to the right nor to the left. The windows and the doors were full of people who were eager to see them. What a pity that such brave young men should be food for the Minotaur, said some. Ah, that maiden so beautiful should meet a fate so sad, said others. And now they passed by the palace gate where stood King Minos himself and his daughter, Ariadne, the fairest of women in Crete. Indeed, those are noble young fellows, said the king. Yes, too noble to feed the vile Minotaur, muttered Ariadne. The nobler the better, said the king, and yet none of them compare with your lost brother, Androgios. Ariadne said no more, yet she thought that she had never seen anyone who looked so much like a hero as the tallest of the lot, young Theseus. How tall he was and how handsome. How proud his eye, how firm his step. Surely there had never been his like in Crete. All through that night, Ariadne lay awake and thought of the Athenian man and grieved that he should be doomed to perish, and suddenly she began to lay plans for setting him free. At the earliest peep of day, she arose, and while everybody else was asleep, she ran out of the palace and hurried to the prison. As she was the king's daughter, the jailer opened the door at her bidding. There sat the seven youths and the seven maidens on the ground, but they had not lost hope. She took Theseus aside and whispered to him. She told him of a plan which she had made to save him. Theseus promised her that when he had slain the Minotaur, he would carry her away with him to Athens, where she should live with him always. And then she gave him a sharp sword, which uh, he had hidden, un which he hid underneath his cloak, telling him that with it alone could he hope to slay the Minotaur. And here also is a ball of silken thread. She said, as soon as you go into the labyrinth where the monster is kept, fasten one end of the thread to the stone doorpost and then unwind it as you go along. When you have slain the Minotaur, you will only have to follow the thread and it will lead you back to the door. In the meantime, I will see that your ship is ready to sail, and then I will wait for you at the door of the labyrinth. Theseus thanked the beautiful princess and promised her again that if she, he should live to go back to Athens, she should go with him and be his wife. And then with a prayer to Athena, Ariadne hastened away. The Labyrinth As soon as the sun was up, the guards led the young prisoner into the labyrinth. They did not see the sword which Theseus hid under his cloak, nor the tiny ball of silk which he held in his closed hand. They led the youths and maidens a long way into the labyrinth, and then the guards left them, as they had left many others before, to wander about until they should be found by the terrible Minotaur. Stay close by me, said Theseus to his companions, and with the help of Athena, who dwells in her temple home in our fair city, I will save you. And then he drew his store, sword and stood in the narrow way before them, and they all lifted up their hands and prayed to Athena. For hours they stood there hearing no sound and seeing nothing but the smooth high walls on either side of the passage and the calm blue sky so high above them. And then the maidens sat down on the ground and covered their faces and sobbed. Oh, that he would come and put an end to our misery and our lives. At last, late in the day, they heard a bellowing, low and faint as though far away. They listened and soon heard it again, a little louder and very, very fierce and dreadful. It is he, it is he, cried Theseus. And now for the fight. And then he shouted so loudly that the walls of the labyrinth answered back, and the sound was carried upward to the sky and outward to the rocks and cliffs of the mountains. The Minotaur heard him, and his bellowings grew louder and fiercer every moment. He's coming, cried Theseus. And he ran forward to meet the beast. The seven maidens shrieked, but tried to stand up bravely and face their fate. The six young men stood together with firm set teeth and clenched fists, ready to fight to the last. Soon the Minotaur came into view, rushing down the passage toward Theseus and roaring most terribly. He was twice as tall as a man, and his head was like that of a bull, with huge sharp horns and fiery eyes and a mouth as large as a lion's. But the young men could not see the lower part of his body for the cloud of dust which he raised in running. When he saw Theseus with the sword in his hand coming to meet him, he paused, for no one had ever faced him that way before. And then the monster put his head down and rushed forward bellowing, but the Theseus leaped quickly aside and made a sharp thrust with his sword as he passed and hewed off one of the monster's legs above the knee. The Minotaur fell upon the ground roaring and groaning and beating wildly about with his horned head and his hoof-like fists, but 
Theseus nimbly ran up to him and thrust the sword into his heart and was away again before the beast could harm him. A great stream of blood gushed from the wound, and soon the Minotaur was dead. And then the youths and maidens ran to Theseus and kissed his hands and feet and thanked him for his great deed. As it was already growing dark, Theseus bade them follow him while he wound up the silken thread, which was to lead them out of the labyrinth. Through a thousand rooms and courts and winding ways they went, and at midnight they came to the outer door and saw the city lying in the moonlight before them. Only a little way off was the seashore where the black ship was moored with, uh, which had brought them to Crete. The door was wide open, and beside it stood Ariadne, waiting for them. The wind is fair, the sea is smooth, and the sailors are ready, she whispered, taking the arm of Theseus. When the morning dawned, they were far out to sea, and looking back from the deck of the little vessel, only a speck of the Cretan mountains were in sight. Minos, when he arose from sleep, did not know that the youths and maidens had gotten safely out of the labyrinth, but when Ariadne could not be found, he thought that robbers had carried her away. He sent soldiers out to search for her among the hills and mountains, never dreaming that she was now well on the way towards distant Athens. Many days passed, and at last the searchers returned and said that the princess could not be found. The king covered his head and wept and said, Now, indeed, I am bereft of all my treasures. But in, uh, back in Athens, Aegeus had sat day after day on the rock by the shore, looking and watching in hope that he might see a ship coming from the south. At last, the vessel which uh, Theseus and his companions was spotted, but it still only carried the black sail. For in their joy, the young men had forgotten to raise the white one. Alas, alas, my son has perished, moaned Aegeus, who fainted and fell forward into the sea and was drowned. That sea, um, from then on, has been called by his name, the Aegean Sea. Theseus grieved the loss of his father that he barely knew, but he was comforted by his new love and his new friends. The people of Athens declared their choice. Uh, the boorish nephews were ousted from the palace, and Theseus, the people's hero, would be their new king.